Hello everyone and welcome to our very own University Book Club. Today devoted to the subject Intercultural Communication and its Applications to Translation. Uh, today, as I say, from Monteborreiro in Pontevedra, this beautiful park and promenade from which I'm speaking and recording myself, we'll try to discuss and draw some conclusions from the work by Tracy Novinger, published in 2001 by University of Texas Press. It's entitled Intercultural Communication, and it's a practical guide that will give us a lot of information about several topics. In particular, it's uh, intended to be a transversal and multi-subject book devoted to linguistics, translation, history of language and uh, a little bit of anthropology. Uh, we'll concentrate on the first two chapters of the first part. The first part is entitled uh, Global Approach to Intercultural Communication and the first and second chapters give us the whys and whats. Why intercultural communication? Why is it important to communicate across cultures? And the second part, the second chapter, that is to say, which is uh, what is culture? How to define it? We'll get to it. In the preface to the book, before the first chapter, Tracy Novinger points out that geographically the world is shrinking, but culturally the world is equally large as it was a century ago. Uh, the means of communication allow us to be able to reach countries that are really far away and cultures that were previously unknown to us. But that is never an impediment, because the transport is there and the way to arrive a different country is evidently accessible to everyone. The problem comes when we start to discuss and to make disquisitions about cultures themselves. Firstly, we have the cultures that are almost the same as ours but have certain differences that make some negotiations difficult to finish successfully. Another problem would be negotiating with a culture or doing business with a culture about which we know nothing. In that case, confusions may arise. That is what intercultural communication as a competence or the proficient use of intercultural communication may facilitate in our case. Novinger in the first chapter explains that there are two kinds of cultures. A wide division may be made between the low context cultures, that is to say, cultures that rely very heavily on words and not very much on behavior, that is to say, non-verbal language. And on the other side, we have cultures such as Japan or Mexico, to give just two examples, which rely very heavily on non-verbal communication. About this, we should make the precision that uh, there are two types of communication, two types of message conveyance that we may put forward. Firstly, it's a verbal communication, the one that uses the complex code that we humans have come to master to transform our thoughts into words and to make them reach an interlocutor. On the other hand, we have nonverbal communication, which does not depend on the code explicitly, but uh, consciously or subconsciously is capable of transferring the message in the same way. However, we may ask ourselves what happens when low culture low context culture, that is to say, and high context culture encounter one another and are forced to reach some kind of agreement. Well, this happens most of the time and this is precisely what the practical guide written by Novinger tries to prevent. For example, let's imagine that we had a North American, a person from the United States, trying to understand what a Japanese or a Mexican person is meaning by saying no. Saying no directly in Japan or in Mexico is considered impolite and that is not the case in the United States. Someone may say no, to be clear, because they don't want to do a certain specific thing. However, a Japanese or a Mexican person will try to avoid saying no to be polite, but when they are saying let me think about it or by saying perhaps, they are really meaning no. When uh, this comes to the misunderstanding that would be logical, then uh, frustration arises. And uh, taken to the extreme, this may lead to violent confrontation. 
when cultures are really separate from one another. In the end, as anthropologists in the 1960s were pointing out already, all forms of behavior are communication, but also all forms of communication are behavior. For that reason, we cannot stop communicating because we cannot stop behaving. For that, communication is done in spite of ourselves, as Novinger points out at the very beginning. Having mentioned the previous points in order, we may reach the immediate conclusion that culture, as opposed to language, is not something that comes to us naturally or that is inherited in any way. We may state that language is something that we are programmed genetically to become skillful in and to develop over a certain period of time. However, it's not the same with culture whatsoever. With culture, the case is much different because when we are brought into this world, our parents are already members of a certain culture and respond to the restrictions, constrictions and limitations imposed by that precise system. And we, as individuals, start becoming embedded in the same culture and when we are skilled enough, then we will become accepted. This kind of approach can be analyzed theoretically following Kenneth Pike's suggestion that emic and etic are two different visions of the same phenomenon. For instance, if we start from the culture general approach, we may see that it is strange to us, it is alien to our culture, that we use bones to decorate our bodies. However, from an emic perspective, that is to say culture specific, as Kenneth Pike points out, and on which Tracy Novinger insists, then we may ascertain that bones do not only decorate but have a meaning, and that meaning would be a hierarchy as expressed socially. On the other hand, we may also introduce another distinction, which is the behaviors that are socially acceptable for a specific situation, context and social group, for instance the way we eat in public, the way we greet some other people, if it is tu or usted in Spanish, for instance, that is a great distinction even in Spanish-speaking nations. Let's compare Colombia, which is much more, much more formal, with Venezuela, as Tracy Novinger does, which, according to her, is much more informal and egalitarian, let's call it that. But it also applies to the way one excuses oneself or the behaviors that are permitted or the ones for which you are castigated. These limitations that culture imposes may do anything from deify to incarcerate the individual which produces these practices. And it is the observation and censorship of the other individuals that determines which of these fates is possible and most probable. With all the information we have gathered up to this point, we see that it's not only translation or intercultural communication itself that may be applicable to the whole theory, but also, and more specifically, pragmatics as a part of linguistics. Pragmatics is more interested in answering the question, what do you mean by X, instead of saying what X means. That would be a question of syntactics or maybe semantics. When we talk about pragmatics related to communication, we are probably remembering things previously said by Austin, Searle, the acts of communication, the acts of language, the difference between those two, implicatures and also Grice's maxims. But all of this as a whole coincides with Goffman's theory of face, that is to say, the way communication in public affect us and the way we affect others in public communication and the establishment of our own identities. Also, according to Sowell's recent opinion in a book he published in 1994, isolation and stagnation accompanies cultures which prefer to not communicate rather than be open to others. Um, Tracy Novinger identifies uh, optimism, dynamism, and the ability to have an open culture 
with the possibility of interculturally communicate. Uh, one's identity is established by the way others judge his own acts, but it's also dependent on the special characteristics of that particular culture. Two cultures, as we pointed out at the beginning, may be so far apart that only one of the aspects that come into consideration, apart from its history, its political organization, its religion, its traditions, its customs, and many other details, such as the movements of one's hands, the direction of one's glance, etc., are very influential on the way one thinks of himself and the way one may have the epiphany of being able to see oneself after coming into contact with a new culture. The final conclusion of this section, covering chapters 1 and 2 of Novinger's book, would be as follows. Intercultural communication is a must in the modern world, but intercultural communication needs collaboration between two. The last part of this presentation includes a synthesis of chapters 1 and 2 of Novinger's work, Intercultural Communication, a Practical Guide. In the preface, we see that the author indicates that technology has been expanding for the last few decades and, at the same time, geography, geographical distances in particular, have done nothing but shrink. We may now reach any destination we want anywhere in the globe in less than 24 hours. But meeting new people, especially people we know nothing or very little about, requires effective communication. There are three terms also that we must pay very special attention to. One of them is the existence of cultural differences, cultural difference as the separation between the two speakers that are located in the same environment in the moment of exchanging the information. Also, communication as a verbal and nonverbal or behavioral aspect, and finally, acculturation, a process by which anyone who is brought into the world into a certain culture becomes a part of it by accepting its limitations and restrictions consciously and subconsciously. Entering now the first chapter, Why Communicate Across Cultures, we may remember Vatslatsky et al.'s 1967 statement that all behavior is communication and vice versa, we may add. All communication is behavior. We can never stop behaving, we can never stop communicating, we are doing it continuously and permanently. Therefore, translations need to know about the verbal and non-verbal dimensions of language. Culture, additionally, restricts the free will of the speaker, but not only of the speaker, but of the individual. Going on with the same chapter, we have to make the necessary distinction between low-context and high-context cultures. The first one relies on words, for example the USA, while the second relies more on behaviors, or the non-verbal side of communication. And one example, as presented in the initial part of this video, was Japan, along with Mexico, for instance. The similarities in low- and high-context cultures, when they are both in the same communicative exchange, may become obstacles, and that is the centerpiece of this Communication Across Cultures dedicated chapter. The quest for shared meaning is a key issue in communicative exchanges. There has to be a common ground to favour understanding. Otherwise, Sowell, in 1994, well put it by saying that cultural balkanization leads to isolation. Excessive separation between cultures is not conducive to dynamism and adaptability. In fact, it's not even conducive to optimism. Entering now the second chapter, what constitutes a culture? We know that it's difficult to define the term, but we may assume it's related to the knowledge that is passed on from one generation to the next, and the patterns too, through which communication is filtered, and through which there are limitations to the speaker's free will. In this relation, Hall's 1976 situational frames coincide with Goffsman's view of regulations imposed by culture as a traffic system. In other words, situational frames are patterns of behavior for specific situations, and they are the building blocks of culture, according to the same author. 
It is then possible to identify two different aspects of communication which are not incompatible, quite on the contrary, they are necessary in coexistence. The first one is intermittent, the conveyance of new information, it cannot be a continuous process, otherwise we would, for lack of a better word, become intoxicated. And the second one is a continuous process, which regulates the interaction between speakers and maintains an open channel of communication and informational exchange. We must then take into account that culture is a presented as normative, while in fact it's a construct, and b perceived as innate, inherited or natural, while in fact it is again something that is socially construed. This is relevant because the constraints and limitations that are socially dependent include directives and prohibitions which affect the speaker's decisions, as well as encouragements and warnings to direct his own behaviour, the non-verbal part of linguistic interaction. Another contribution from the field of anthropology is Spike's 1956 distinction between the etic and the imic approaches. From the outside in implies that we are observers of culture in general, and we criticize what we find alienating. And from the inside out refers to us as members of that particular culture interpreting the meaning that could not be understood from the outside. In fact, this is nothing but a culture general and a culture specific analysis. But it establishes a taxonomy that determines and facilitates the analysis of cultural building blocks. One legitimate question we may ask ourselves after all of these pieces of information is what does culture as a system intend by limiting its members' free will? The most immediate answer would be to achieve predictability of behaviour. No one escapes society's encompassing control because everyone is a member of that culture and accepts his rules and functions within this framework. Another would be to outline cultural patterns that are relatively flexible and keep evolving as time goes on. Another concept that should not escape us is government's 1963's proposal of a negatively eventful act as that one characterized by the two following features. If it is not performed, it implies negative sanctions. However, if it is performed, it passes unnoticed. This would be the case of knocking on a door, for example, before going into someone else's office. If we are strangers and do not knock, we would be considered impolite and receive a sanction, a social sanction. If we knock on the door, we may act normally and naturally because we are following cultural patterns within a specific society. Finally, we are going to refer to the possible consequences of culture clash as those described previously when talking about low-context and high-context cultures. If this clash produces what would be considered a positive result, preconceived ideas would be suppressed or reduced. That is what Novinger repeatedly describes as having an epiphany. On the other hand, these preconceptions may be reinforced and become fossilized. As a conclusion drawn from all the previous points, we may indeed say that when cultural differences go to extremes, communication as a process might indeed become impossible. This would be an unsuccessful communicative act. Finally, here are some questions for further discussion. Firstly, it would be interesting to determine whether there are any constraints to individual and social free will in one's own culture, but also this is the second point, to see if there are ethnocentric practices related to the low context or high context characteristics of this culture and whether stagnation or dynamism is the main feature. We hope that these materials have been useful and invite any viewer to leave a comment in the comments section. Thank you and goodbye.